Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Bailey Bookish Podcast. So a couple quick announcements before we get into this week's episodes on the Great Gatsby movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. So this Friday we will be having a Patreon exclusive episode about Lost in Austin and that'll be featuring Amanda Faye. Uh, who was with us for Pride and Prejudice, and that's going to be a lot of fun. The next book we are going to be talking about is going to be Alice in Wonderland, as well as Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Uh, we, Our special guest for that one is going to be Leah from YA Book Chat, and if you have not listened to YA Book Chat, please go listen to it. It is very, very good. I think a lot of you are really going to like it, so I highly recommend checking that podcast out if you haven't had the chance to do that yet. Also, we have a merch store. If you haven't had a chance to look at the merch store, please go check it out. Um, If you go to barelybookish.com slash connect, it has links to absolutely everything, including the merch store. Um, We have a poor Cthulhu shirt and tank top and sweaters, as well as logo shirts, tank top, sweaters, all that good stuff. But yeah, without further ado, let's get into the episode. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Barely Bookish podcast and today we are covering the 2013 Great Gatsby with Leonardo DiCaprio. I forgot to write down the director's name otherwise I would have just said that but Boz Lerman. There we go someone one of us is prepared. Do you want to uh, start that again? Boz Lerman? Boz Lerman yeah Lerman. the same guy who directed um, the Leo version of Romeo and Juliet and mm-hmm. Moulin Rouge. Honestly, you know what? I'm keeping that. There you go. <laughs> Which is important because the visuals are very similar. And if you've seen those other two movies, you will feel the Boz Lerman vibe in this one. I, which is one of my first notes. Really? Yeah, I have not seen anything else. Oh, we should introduce you. Uh, Jessica is back and joining us once again. Hi, everyone. <laughs> you know, a, a cold open is always a good opening, you know? I love it. I love like it. like ice cream. Yeah. Cold, I mean, sweet. It's like you're right here with us, friendly listeners. Yeah, there you go. Who wants hot ice cream? Then you're just drinking milk. No, cold ice cream all the way. Cold, cold opener open. all the way. Like straight out of the freezer, cold open. Um, <laughs> That's us. We barely opened the door, to be honest. I we know. We came at the ice cream container with a spoon. Yep. No no bowls for us. Just straight nope. out of the gallon, watching a movie as if it's a rom-com and we just went through our first breakup, okay? That's how cold this open is. And somehow I feel like Gatsby would support that at mm-hmm. one of his parties absolutely there's definitely people who are freezer ice cream aficionados gatsby has the the freezer stocked just for those people and every time the ice cream gets a little melty it goes in the freezer and another gallon comes out to replace it there you go i do want to watch now i didn't even know leonardo dicaprio was in a romeo and juliet so now i'm curious oh my gosh okay so (laughs) let's have a side conversation here where i tell you that that was a transformative film for me as a youth. Um, so you definitely should watch it. Um, but yes, Boz Lerman did a um, Romeo and Juliet version um, and it stars Leon- Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. And it is a delight, um, a riotous delight of color and sound and everything else and has one of the best soundtracks ever. Um, and then he also directed Moulin Rouge um, with Heard Nicole that. Kidman and Ewan McGregor. So this style, as soon as the movie came on, I was like, oh, Art Deco Boz Lerman. I like it. I like it. Um, and as you go on through the movie, you see a lot of his touches. So like one thing that the Romeo and Juliet is very notable for is that there's some classic music, but it's mostly like popular. It's almost entirely popular music. So in this in this version, when they started playing hip hop, I was like, okay, feeling that, got that. Very Boz Lerman. I know. When Lana Del Rey came on, I was like, okay. <laughs> right? Sounds good, I guess. Like, Yeah, yeah. So it's a different feel. 
I know. I'm seeing a lot of like romanticized old timey movies now. Like I just watched Bridgerton, very romanticized of the era. Um, Pride and Prejudice was, but then I saw I think it was Sense and Sensibility where it was not romanticized at all, and I was like, oh, your skirt is dirty, huh? Yeah, is that the one where? Okay, we don't we're gonna delve down this rabbit hole it's okay but i feel like that's the one where there's like you actually see farm animals and whatnot in their home <laughs> yeah i know i was like huh weird all right because you know 2005 prime yeah. prejudice everything like they're poor but like everything's clean and beautiful and then like sense and sensibility is like oh no like we're dirty like things are dirty this is the 1800s things are kind of gross here and i was like yeah oh, okay yeah that makes sense Anyways, 2013, Great Gatsby. So my first note is that is the brightest light I've ever seen on the edge of someone's dock. Like it is shining. And I'm like, your neighbors must absolutely hate your guts. It is certainly so- no, yeah, certainly no way that they could do anything but see that green light. Yeah. And it just but- blinks incessantly. I know. And I'm like, I guess it's for like boats and stuff so they don't hit your dock but like at one point did you have so many boats that were hitting your dock that you had to get the brightest light humanly possible like this feels like the people that they had gotten one like they got rear-ended once and then they switched their taillights to being the flashing ones that whenever they hit the brakes it looks like they're you know when you stamp a stomp on your brakes and it flashes and they do it just every single time they hit their brakes like what happened that you felt that that need it's it's definitely a choice it's definitely a choice (laughs) and it's interesting because um i don't think in the movie at least i don't know if in real life but in the movie we definitely don't see any other docks that have a bright green flashing light so um and it's a it's an interesting choice for sure i blame tom buchanan yeah and the fact that tom's like Oh, I didn't even know we had that light. Like, is it not piercing your eyes at night? Because you <laughs> Well, know... it's going straight out into the water, so he probably can't see it at all. Well, when he was looking at it, there was a back light, too. So it looked like it was like a 360 light. Because you can oh, still see true. that it was flashing. And I was like, it may be the back's a little dimmer. I, don't... I mean, he's Tom Buchanan. Does he even notice anything but how, like, ruggedly handsome he is? I mean, honestly... His entire so, life is just a series of mirrors. So my literal first note for this watching this movie is WTF sanitarium because <laughs> the movie starts as a frame story of Nick telling his story to a psychiatrist instead mm-hmm. of writing it. And I was like, ah, telling the story to a psychiatrist instead of writing is a choice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I get it. Nick's been through some things, but as soon as he's like basically pacing this therapist office i was like okay like I mean, he didn't even do the whole like lay down on a con he's like my life has been strange kind of thing i just feel like it's it's i it almost takes away from the story it took away from the story for me because i mean nick doesn't need that mm-hmm. it it's just as fine like just as good for me as an enjoyer of it if he's just writing this yeah i did i did like when it flashed over like what his chart said and it said morbidly alcoholic was his diagnosis (laughs) (laughs) the only thing i noticed was that it said doctor's note and it just wrote as large as humanly possible gatsby (laughs) to take up the entire box oh my gosh morbidly alcoholic It, it just it said morbidly alcoholic that was one of his diagnoses. And then it said, you know, anxiety or depression or whatever. But I just thought that was very, um, <laughs> it was a very hilarious, like hilariously, like specific mm-hmm. diagnosis. And I mean, it fit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah. Oh, so, so from funny. there, then we finally get into him actually telling the story, mm-hmm. but now he's gonna write it down i don't know i just it felt weird to me i was like i don't i'm not really sure why boz thought that was necessary to frame it like that but okay yeah it's weird because it's if you when you read the book it seems like he's writing this story as a memoriam to gatsby and to like tell everyone about his life whereas now they've shaped it that he's writing this story 
to cope with everything he went through. Exactly. It gives it a different feel. Yeah. Yeah. This book, de- uh, the movie definitely takes a lot of things that happen and gives them a slight different twist, which mm-hmm. we're going to get into a lot, but yeah, it's interesting. So next we get to the scene with the cottage that he's staying in. And like this place is supposed to be a rundown shack that everyone forgot it about and this is the most beautiful and stunning cottage i've ever seen in my entire life it's adorable adorable the only rundown thing around it is that like the trees are overgrown that are around it so it it almost reminds you of you know like the gingerbread cottage in the forest kind yeah. of thing um and then he looks through his window and you can see the castle next door mm-hmm. um but yeah it definitely didn't look run down at all when I was reading Little Women, this is the proximity I imagined that they were to each other, the March family and mm-hmm. Lori. And then when I watched the 2019, he had to like trek back to his house. And I was like, um, he's supposed to be able to like look inside their windows at night and see that they're all having a good time. And you're telling me that he somehow has binoculars by his bedside. Okay. I mean, for the Little Women podcast, I wouldn't put it past Lori, but also, <laughs> I also didn't, but I will say with The Great Gatsby, when I was reading, I didn't envision that it was quite as close, that he could yeah. literally be standing in his window of his cottage and look up and Gatsby could make out his face, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was an interesting choice, but. Yeah, I didn't think they were going to be that close, and then watching the movie i was like oh he's like spitting distance to gatsby's house basically he he could use a walkie-talkie he could hang up a paper cup with a string in between two paper cups and talk to gatsby that's how close they are he doesn't even have to call yeah it felt like the tampa houses where it's like you literally just kind of you can't even lay in between the two houses they're so close like yeah it felt like if if he wanted to pass Gatsby a note he could just like make a paper airplane and throw it over that's how close the house was and then then well then you're watching it and you're going hold on a second does this little cottage house belong to Gatsby's house yeah that's what I'm starting to think too because it's like they say it's his gatehouse basically so who's the land uh not land landlord like who's the landlord of this house is it Gatsby we never hear anything about the house at all except that he's paying 80 dollars a month for it like we don't know who the landlord is or are they illegally stealing this from gatsby and just renting it out and hoping gatsby doesn't mind (laughs) i don't think it's the i don't think it's that one but the proximity in the movie leads you to believe that there there is a lot more possibility yeah I did think, it kind of reminded me of, okay, so if you go near the beach, um, like really anywhere, go any place that has a beach town or has like a coastal town um, or, you know, even an island like this in, in the Northeast and you go right along the edge of the water, it's really, and now you see it a ton, there'll be like these huge houses and then right next to it, there's like this little teeny shack. Yeah. it's just that that part of land those those homeowners and that land those landowners won't give it up to get redeveloped into that huge mansion yeah um so that's kind of the vibe that i got when i saw it in the movie but i liked how it looked it didn't take me out of it i thought actually thought it looked really cute yeah me too but they do say that it was an old guard house guard yeah but gatekeeper house or but like was it for gatsby's house or was it for another house like it doesn't really clear we don't know who the other neighbor is either right could be the next house over kind of thing dun, dun, dun. it's a possibility that's okay you know what another fan fiction idea tell me about the other neighbor on the other side of gatsby or the other side of nick tell me what they were like <laughs> so my next note is tom even looks like a dirt bag also they made tom and nick have a history which was really really strange to me whereas it was supposed to be daisy's his cousin and Mm -hmm. she just happened to have married tom but apparently tom and him now went to school together which i think they might have touched on in the book but definitely 
you never got any impression in the book at least i didn't that these two had a buddy ship or they had yeah. like a little handshake or something that was weird i wrote down tom i still hate you mm-hmm absolutely <laughs> um but in that same section i was saying that the pace felt really frantic and then suddenly it just stops boom and that's like to me very Boz Lerman in cut so in connection with the visuals which I think are incredibly detailed and like the highs the high colors the high contrast are really high and the lows are really really low mm -hmm. that just gives you a really frantic heightened feel um throughout the entire story and it, it makes you feel um almost in a way that like a Hitchcock movie makes you feel like you're on edge the entire time. Mm -hmm. You're just frantic. You're kind of jittery so that when it stops, you're like, Ooh, and it really throws you out. Yeah. So just interesting touches. It does make the pace of the movie go very, very quickly. Until it isn't quick yeah. until it suddenly stops. And you're like, weird. Yeah. You're so. like thrown into it. And then like, we're going to slow down for this important tidbit. Okay. Back up, back up. And we're like, <laughs> But I did think it, it oh yeah, it is. I, I did I did like in that scene, like the in, inaccuracies aside about, you know, who knew who and whatever. I felt like our first glimpse of the characters, I was like, Yeah, accurate. I got mm -hmm. that. I see that. Like Daisy looks how I would imagine she would look. Jordan looks like how I kind of like I would imagine her to look. Mm -hmm. Tom looks like I would imagine him to look, you know. Absolutely. Um, the setting, the vibe, it feels like how you would think of it i mean even toby mcguire as nick perfect it, oh yeah it just you feel it so yeah i really like toby mcguire already so him as nick i was like yeah that fits for me because mm -hmm. that was like right after 2013 i think that was right after spider-man right yeah yeah i put some i put a note later when i was watching it but i was just like T toby mcguire is so damn bright-eyed as nick he is so bright-eyed he is so earnest he is so <laughs> taking in every single thing around him and a kind of also like that he's kind of normal mm -hmm. like toby mcguire is attractive but like he just he's just kind of like he's not he's not super hot he's not super buff he's just kind of like a dude and i really like that um in a role like nick so yeah. i think he was a good choice he always he to me always looks like a best friend character, not mm -hmm. like a love interest character, which is fine. But I, I think it's funny when I look at Toby Maguire because he just looks innocent and trusting. And like I have to remember that he is a real person, but like he's so typecasted it into like these like good and you know, happy go lucky kind of roles that like every time they're like, Oh, and he has a girlfriend, I'm like, does he? Does he not just like the best friend guy? Okay. He seems like the kind of guy that you could like tell your stories to. Mm -hmm. And he, I would trust him to walk my dog. Like he mm -hmm. seems like a pretty normal guy. But I think as a in as a character in a book, especially one like Nick, who we want to see as that reader's friend, like we talked about in the beginning, mm -hmm. who tells us the story, who's there in the moment for us, we want to believe him. Tobey Maguire gives off a feeling of like, I could believe this guy yeah perfect. this is how he really saw it so yeah like i don't think he would ever lie to me ever <laughs> trust that man with my life um so we get introduced to jordan we get introduced to jordan and daisy and i'm gonna say it it looked like they were doing it like you caught them in the midst of because they got like that whole i don't know like ethereal drapes flying everywhere there's arms coming up off the couch and i'm like I I I see what you're saying. That's not the interpretation that I had, but I you definitely get the feeling that they are very close and that they were having some sort of like flirty girl time type thing. Um, and you certainly get the feeling that like lines were blurred. I didn't necessarily think that they were like that in that moment they were in the act of anything, um, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that. Boz wasn't trying to hint to us that that might exist yeah like I thought they at least had to be like making out or something like and you know Boz could very well have been trying to tell us that 
Yeah. Because, like, the way Tobey Maguire's eyes just widen as he walks in there, like, he walked in on something, I was like, they're definitely behaving in a way that is outside the realm of what quote unquote proper ladies probably do right yeah. even if all they're doing is laying around with their legs up giggling that's definitely like outside the realm of what proper ladies do so toby's uh or toby's nick having the like shocked wonderment on his face i yeah i think we yeah. all felt that i know and i do like all the drapes going around that was very cool but it was like a weird piece of cinematography for me a little bit because I was like why why are they why is this happening kind of thing I think they mentioned that in the book though I feel like when he first walked in the windows were open and the blinds were floating around I mean maybe not to that extent but one thing I will say as an overall of the movie is I got this feeling because everything is so heightened that it almost felt like a stage a stage musical version of this Mm -hmm. book so True. if this book was going to be put on stage as a musical, this is what you have. And so if in that case, if this was going to be a stage production, those wildly billowing drapes would be a perfect touch to yeah. indicate some, you know, like wild, ex- some wildness, some freedom, um, some carefreeness. And then Tom walks in and closes everything. So yeah. it's like very symbolic of that shift. Um, so if you think of it like that, I think it makes a little bit more sense. But Yeah, true. That makes sense. And then the way Nick looks at Daisy a couple times throughout this movie, it was like very much crossing the line of cousin relationship. And I was like, like, I know they're distant, but like, are they that distant kind of thing? <laughs> I didn't, It's funny because like, I didn't get any feeling like he like, had any romantic feelings towards her I got the feeling that he was sort of looking at her almost the way that you might look at like a muse or the way that you might look at just like someone on the stage Mm -hmm. like otherworldly this person doesn't exist in the same world that I exist in they are beyond that that's kind of the feeling that I got so when he looks at her with like these wide eyes this excite these excited eyes it's like wow like you live in a completely different world than I live in Mm -hmm. like you you, do we breathe the same air you know because how could we and how and you be the way that you are in the best possible way you Mm -hmm. know um I think that he's kind of charmed by the way that she is and the way that she lives in the beginning I will say it's probably that same similar argument though where it's hard as a writer to describe really attractive people without putting it through the narrator's voice Mm -hmm. so it's kind of one of those things where it's like nick has to acknowledge these kinds of things but it kind of makes you question nick a little bit because like the same thing happens with harry potter where harry describes like all these men as hot so there's this whole headcanon that harry potter is bisexual um Mm -hmm. but of course you know jk rowling as a terrible author um (laughs) but as an author nonetheless has to describe people as being attractive so the reader understands what they look like kind of thing so I think that he definitely understands that she I mean first of all I don't think there's any doubt that Nick as a character is at minimum bisexual Mm -hmm. if not some if if not somewhere else on the spectrum of sexuality like he is for he's for sure not scared to um to appreciate people and whatever their form is Mm -hmm. and i think that shows throughout the book and several like situations that he's in um but so i don't think it's you know like he talks about how attractive tom is he talks about how attractive daisy is and but i I do think he's also very much like charmed as you know um surprised but in a good way sort of how daisy actually is and like how she goes about the way she talks the way that she acts um, her manner, her mannerisms. These are things that he he thinks are really interesting to mm-hmm. her, um, and so I think that's what it is. But I, I've, I didn't really get the feeling that he like was romantically attracted to her. Yeah. I mean, I definitely didn't get the feeling he was romantically attracted to Jordan at all. So <laughs> not in the movie, but in the book, I didn't think that. But in the movie, when they like have him like look at her this way, I was like, 
Uh, weird, but okay. Uh-uh. Hell no. <laughs> so then, you know, we get the clarification that we were pulling no punches in this movie. Tom is still an extreme racist, which I'm glad they didn't change that. Like, I was worried because I hadn't seen this full movie that they were going to try and make us like Tom Buchanan. And I am yeah. so thankful that they were like, no, this is the character he is. He is an extreme racist. Tom, I still hate you. It stands. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. And there's a point where he's like, "What? what's going to happen next? We're going to be in um, white people are going to marry black people. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, oh. Which that comes directly from the book. Yeah, I know. And so, I, and you're just like, ooh, okay. You pulled yeah. all the best quotes, Boz. You really want no no one to have thought, okay, well, he's a little cute, so maybe I like, nope, nope. still a bad guy. Mm-mm. No. Nope. Mm-mm. He's no, the no, only no. villain that I don't care if they get a redemption arc because I hate him. He looks like the kind of guy who uses his cane to hit the servants, quote unquote. Yes. Like he just, he's not, mm-mm. No. Trash bag of a human. So then the telephone rings. Yeah, then the telephone rings. Uh, (laughs) And everyone's like, it was so much louder in this movie just to fully draw your attention to it. And I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, they played up that to the tension of the telephone ring. Mm -hmm. That was definitely a uh, Chekhov's gun sort of situation. Like they played up every element of that telephone ringing. This telephone like followed them around places too. Like how long was the cord? Because it felt like it was everywhere Tom needed it to be. Like it was outside when they were golfing, you know, like are they having to unplug the telephone, replug it in? And do they have outside telephone lines? I mean, probably all of the above, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was just a ridiculously long cord because yeah. in a lot of houses when they recorded telephones, there were really, really, really long cords. Yeah, I remember growing up, my grandparents would not switch to a normal landline. So they still, they both had a rotary phone Mm -hmm. and a corded house phone. And my grandmother would not switch no matter how much we told her that like her cell, her um, home phone is just has the worst quality. So she, because she liked to hold it and then walk Mm -hmm. around and never lose it. Yeah. But it was, it was just funny. So like... (laughs) I don't know. I'm like trying to figure out how much of this phone is available. I I didn't even notice that they were different colors, to be honest, to see if they were like different phones. Yeah, I mean, but but honestly, like I wouldn't be surprised if there was one that was that if they had a cord that was long enough to reach into a different room or outside. Um, and if they had people whose entire purpose was to help him with the phone then those people could also wrangle that cord. I'm just having very specific visuals of like 80s movies where the teenage girl has like the puffy rotary phone and she's like carrying it by the, what is that called? The receiver? That's not right. (laughs) Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yes. carrying it with one hand, and then she's uh-huh. walking around her room. So everywhere. yeah, welcome to my middle school. <laughs> I know. I thanks we didn't for have... call. Thanks for calling out my youth. I appreciate <laughs> it. The only rotary phone we had was at my grandparents' house, and I always remember people being like, "Because my I was the age of Firefly phones." Okay, in middle school. So people be like, I bet you don't even know how to use a rotary phone. And I'm like, actually, I do. I know how to use a rotary phone. Like, do you know what a leapfrog is, Karen? I don't think you do. I was very proud of my uh, ability to call out it. the fact that I knew how to use a rotary phone. So I love it. I get the feeling that Daisy would be happy if nobody knew how to use a damn phone because she's tired of that phone. Yeah. Um which we see why minutes later. Yep. I, I bet <laughs> Daisy has thrown like six phones into the um, river. Mm-hmm. They probably have a storeroom in their house that's just full of spare copies of that phone. I bet For when Daisy learned angry. how to do wiring and just cuts the phone wires every so often. I don't even know if she cares that much, but can't you see her just in a tantrum, just 
picking it up and throwing it across the room and then some poor butler like going over sweeping up the pieces going over to a like a pantry opening it up and there's just 15 of the same phone like on the shelves and just picking one up and taking it back <laughs> I can Tom totally McKinnon see that was the first person to ever have Amazon reorder but it was just for rotary <laughs> phones <laughs> Tom Buchanan called the phone company and he's like, I'm going to need 20 of those, old sport. <laughs> old same sport? model. Has to have the same ring because I like it that way. The, uh, the piercing ring of that wonderful rotary phone just mm. to make us all a little sad. So then we get to the point where the therapist is the one who told Nick that he needed to write this all out, which is a choice. It's a choice. <laughs> And then the next note I have is the fact that the train didn't even stop when Tom Buchanan and Nick were going um, over to go see Merle. Like, they yell at them for getting off the train. Yeah, it's that's one of those times when it just feels like if this was a stage play. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with the colors. And when you get first get the visual of um, what the like city of ashes looks like and you're just like wow could it be any more um dirty just cinematographically cinematographically you know created mm -hmm. of what this looks like it could this set be built anymore yeah. um to heighten every single thing that is horrible about this place um so yeah i just i okay i went to london once and honestly, this is not a diss on London at all. But all I can think of the fact is I was not used to smog because I'd never lived in a big city. So mm -hmm. a bunch of our friends got sick because we all lived in a small city uh, from the smog. And like I had sneezed once and black came out. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm just imagining these people who are living in the city all the time, like their lungs had to be coated. Oh, in my gosh. Yes. Tar, not tar, ash. Mm hmm. Oh, <laughs> oh and then okay so you know tom picks up merle and he's like leave right now she's like right now and he's like right now and they all leave and go to the apartment with the cutest dog i've ever seen oh my gosh i wrote down cute puppy awkward situation yeah they did not hint at the fact of merle and tom having sex they were like here this is what's happening making sounds everything literally yes and then Toppy Cannon says that to Nick, he goes, well, I know you like to watch. What situation were they in that this came up? Because apparently Tom acts as if this is a fact that the two of them have experienced together previously. Well, and that goes back to that weird situation where it seems like in this version, mm -hmm. Tom and Nick have some college history. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case... I, I get I don't know but what happened? I will say that nothing about the way that Nick reacted to being in that situation led me to believe he was interested in participating no he looked and uncomfortable then, <laughs> and then right as he tries to escape it's like it gets weirder yeah Nick did not consent to being there for that at all uh yeah I don't think that Nick signed up for an orgy which is exactly <laughs> what it looked like to me <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I feel like they made a really big deal about playing up the awkward sexual energy in the room, especially in regards to McKee, the photographer. I think that was even weirder mm -hmm. in that situation. Yeah, because they made McKee like interested in all of everybody, but they didn't have a Nick McKee situation. No, they didn't have an explicit one like in yeah. the book. Yeah. But it was just it just looked like everybody was just like going wild. And uh I mean Nick, quote unquote, our morbidly alcoholic uh mm -hmm. friend, only the second time he's ever gotten drunk, yeah. gets himself like finds himself in the situation. Like part of it is just it's wild and part of it's also like, wow, like this is a dangerous situation that he got put in. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not one that I feel like he really in his right mind would have consented to be part of and yeah. so it's just it's like it makes it even more um i don't know it just it makes it even more uncomfortable than it was in the book mm -hmm. 
and the Catherine way that forcibly show. slipped him drugs too yeah like people are dr- drugging him he's drinking too much people are mm-hmm. like doing heaven knows what to him like did he consent to those acts that he was partaking in we don't know it's just it's really um it's just a really strange situation and it out it like in the book you can kind of i feel like you can kind of separate out a little bit more because you know you think well he's you know he's drinking of his own accord he's talking to people of his own accord Mm -hmm. but in the movie it seems like his accord is completely removed Mm -hmm. and so then he's involved in this crazy situation and and who knows whatever and then there's that myrtle gets slapped across the face by tom like the world's worst person Mm -hmm. and then the next thing you know he's wa- he's waking up on a park bench or the train bench and you're oh no no he's in at the, his house he's at his house on yeah. his own porch swing like mm-hmm. it's just so there's a lot to unpack there and it certainly seems like there there's certainly a lot more ambiguity in regards to choice mm-hmm. as in, in regards to consent um than i think even is in the book so that's yeah. It kind of, you know, you know, I didn't like Tom before. Kind of makes me hate him even more. Mm-hmm. That he put yeah. our sweet, our sweet Nick in this situation. Our sweet innocent boy. I know. The thing too is in the book, it's like he keeps trying to get out of it, and he gets talked into this. He didn't even get an option. Like mm-hmm. they very much were like, "You're staying, no if ands or buts, but you're mm-hmm. staying." Yeah. They completely take away not just Tom, but a bunch of people take away nick's um agency agency thank you yeah just throughout the whole book and i just feel so bad for nick i feel like throughout the book yeah and in the movie it's even more glaring just how often his his personal opinions on something his feelings his choice is neglected Mm -hmm. his safety whatever like i mean tom starts the entire thing by saying like you're not going to work today what Yeah. You're not only you're not going to work, but you're going to come be a party to me hanging out with my mistress. And now you're going to be in a weird orgy that involves my mistress and like some neighbors and whatever else, like where we're going to drug you to partake in that. Like that's really, really super disturbing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, just super, super, super disturbing. And yeah. in the movie, I think considerably even more triggering and disturbing than it was in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, So then, you know, it's not, it's not a wonder that he doesn't hang out with those people again. And then when you see the next day and, or, you know, the next scene in the movie and he's basically going to a party at Gatsby's house where he was actually asked to be there. It's just like, so weird. Mm -hmm. Once again, another opulent crush of people like it's just exhausting to watch this world happen yeah Um, i'm kind of thinking now what do you think happened to the dog after merle died oh my god uh i I try not to think about it i literally try not to think about it because that is the thought that comes in my head too i think of that sweet little dog like what even happened when she wasn't there who watches this dog yeah, it seems like they had a lot of servants, though. So I'm assuming they have like a housekeeper or something. But at that, at that, make no out shack. Yeah, but like no one. Think about it. When they showed up, the house was clean. There was liquor already there. They didn't have to buy anything for it. Someone's got to be taking care of that place. I don't know. I just I don't want to think about the dog yeah yeah <laughs> and i don't want to think about it too much either because i'm gonna get sad i'm now thinking about nick being like assaulted and i just really can't think of the dog too I know. right now <sighs> i know there's a lot to work through a lot to process i just little off base but i just read Addie larue and it kind of gave me an mm-hmm. existential crisis a little yeah bit. i read that book too mm-hmm. very good but like at the end i'm like well, throughout the entire book, I'm starting to like panic a little bit about my life because Henry starts like counting down, and I'm like, oh, I can't think about that because I'm gonna panic. Yeah, too much anxiety. Yep. Um. So yeah, moving on to the next scene. Yeah, we're at this party. 
no one can drive every single standing space of this party is full and i was like watching it and i was like pre rona would i have liked something like this or would i have been a ex- like an anxious mess throughout this entire thing because like i enjoyed going out i enjoyed partying but there's no standing space like people are bumping into each other trying to walk i can confirm to you that i would have hated everything about that um the crush of people like i was just exhausted watching it um i did think it was adorable that nick keeps trying to show his invitation to literally everyone he goes to like he's like do you know gatsby look at my invitation i was invited do you know i was invited how about look i just want to prove that i'm supposed to be here i was invited and it's just so um it's just it's so bright eyed it's so like just ridiculous um so then we first see gatsby all right I wrote this note and I, I wanted just briefly, we don't have to talk about too long, but I want to delve into the alternate history wherein Jack from Titanic becomes Jay Gatsby. Discuss. I've seen this. I've, okay, <laughs> I've seen this theory before and I love it. I do love it because I, okay, it's been a really long time. I've only seen some parts of the Titanic. I haven't watched the whole thing. So like the ship sinks in the end yeah 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 i got i got that part i got that part i did watch the supernatural episode where the titanic never sank you know because um what's his name hated the movie uh so i love that theory because you know what makes sense mm-hmm. easy same situation yeah i just as soon as i saw him and you know he's got it was i mean of course it's leonardo dicaprio and he's just this like little golden statue himself and he's Mm -hmm. the first thing you see of him is him raising his glass and i just thought to myself oh my god what if jack survived what if he got in another boat and made it to america and became jay gatsby i mean here we are it fits the timeline Mm -hmm. um (laughs) that but yeah photo-esque moment of the fireworks with the glass up would be my Facebook profile photo if I was Leonardo DiCaprio for 20 years. I'm not going to lie to you. That is iconic. Beautiful. He could be full gray. Like he could be, you know, 70. He should still Mm -hmm. use that. You know, like Tinder profiles when people just, you know, use old photos of themselves when they Mm -hmm. get like when you're like dating in your 30s and they're using photos from like when they were 25 Mm -hmm. same moment same moment for Gatsby (laughs) if Gatsby had a dating profile it would be that forever forever I mean there's another great great photo of him that would come later but but we'll discuss when we get there also the fact that this movie is not trying to hide that he's in the mob at all by zooming in on everyone's rings I was like what is the ring supposed to symbolize except that we're guessing they're all part of an organization (laughs) yeah uh and then the next like I mean and then it it kind of plays that up even more when you move on to out right after the party the next big scene with Gatsby is him taking Nick um in his horribly driven car my god what that driving was like terrifying (laughs) terrifying um taking him to like a barbershop slash speakeasy mm-hmm. what i know that he took him to lunch in the book but i i guess i wasn't reading barbershop speakeasy me with, either with strippers dancing and singing at the same time um yeah but i i think also that you know that might be sort of a moulin rouge reference so um I need to watch also that. interesting that of all these places um, this barbershop speakeasy that they had to like go inside and pretend they were going to get shaved or whatever to get in through a back door. How is Tom also there? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I don't understand yeah. how he's there. Did Tom just, does he have mob dealings? How mm-hmm. How is he getting into the speakeasy? Yeah, because it made sense in the book if he's just like at a restaurant or like an, even if it's a nice restaurant, even if it's a private club, mm-hmm. if he was there, it kind of but just the way that they set up the speakeasy aspect of it um i think definitely opens up more cans of worms because everyone that was there was gatsby the commissioner of the 
um, the chief of police, I guess, mm-hmm. the governor, like mm-hmm. all the people who have mob ties were there. And Wolf then Shime. Wolfsheim. And then somehow Tom Buchanan. Well, yeah. And because in the book, wherever they went, what didn't Jordan show up there too? So there's no way she's going to show up at this, like, no, it was right after. She, oh, okay. Yeah, she was. Yeah, it still right was after. weird. It was still was really weird, and how they how they framed it in the book definitely made you feel like Tom had some of these illicit connections as well, more so than the uh, or sorry in the movie made you feel like it more so than in the book, mm-hmm. in my opinion. No, definitely. I was like, oh, okay. Like in the book, I was like, oh, he's kind of like this weird kind of job. I don't know what it is though, but the movie was like he's a mobster right off the bat here's all you need to know so then real casually they switch to oh yeah by the way jordan um is gonna talk to gatsby and yo Mm -hmm. what she wants is um or what gatsby wants is for nick to ask daisy to hang out Mm -hmm. and like nick not even being able to keep his cool when he talks to jordan like, I did not really get that as much. Like, I thought, you know, he's kind of confused and he asked her. When everybody present, Nick's like, what do you have to hide from me? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, it was so strange. Because yeah. you just didn't get the feeling that they even had that much connection at all. Yeah. They, I don't know if in the book, I mean, in the book, he kind of talks about, like, they went on some dates or whatever. But mm-hmm. in the movie, I I didn't get any kind of romantic yeah, connection i got like they were buddies mm-hmm. yeah they definitely did not i'm glad they didn't do that because i thought jordan and nick was always a weird kind of thing and i didn't yeah. think it needed to be explored in the movie it's not the main storyline it doesn't matter Mm-mm. and then gatsby trying to pretend to be as cool as a cat waiting for nick to get back is literally my favorite thing oh so funny um i wrote here like oh my god so many flowers everything is so extreme like so when they he finally goes over there to set up for the the tea party or whatever it's just like he fills nick's entire cottage with flowers Mm -hmm. there's like 16 cakes and then he so and then he's standing around trying like like you said like trying to look like he's cool but then decides at the last minute he's going to go stand outside in the rain. So he ends up walking in disheveled, looking like yep. a wet cat. He also redid the entire lawn. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what? It's cool. He spent all this time to try to make everything look perfect and then literally went outside, got himself soaked when he's wearing like flannel. So he's White. wearing like, like white flannel. He goes outside, gets himself soaked. And I just wrote here, Gatsby looks so angry and then in a flip of a switch looks completely exposed and so awkward and I'm just like thank you Leonardo DiCaprio for your face for this moment because he managed without saying anything to just like convey every single one of those emotions Mm -hmm. as he stood in a wet suit (laughs) and I love that like in our next scene of them being awkward the suit's completely dry and his hair slicked back again I just think it's so funny yes with the clock yeah (laughs) he literally like can't touch anything without breaking it he's just so nervous so funny um and then them playing up the fact that nick is like okay i gotta go to town bye and (laughs) gatsby's like don't don't go no don't go and he nick's like i'm going like just be nice she's nervous and gatsby's like wait she's nervous yeah nick's like don't be a jerk man go back in there and talk to her which is yeah um i then wrote um since when does nick have such a glorious beach view yeah (laughs) literally they look outside his back his like back door and it's just like oh my god he has this beautiful beach view from his backyard which i didn't see and yeah. i didn't imagine it in the book and then you look over and sure enough gatsby's house is just so close by um yeah. i just thought that was just really convenient <laughs> the shack for 80 bucks a month keeps getting better and better like, i know honestly at this point i might move to long island and live <laughs> next to a rich mysterious man with a vague history with possible mobster ties like whatever I mean, he had like this beautiful little cottage right now and what does he need the big house for he's best friends with the guy that owns it he can just go hang out whenever he wants and he yeah. doesn't have to pay for the upkeep seaplane sounds great seaplane right so 
suddenly when they go over to 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 Gatsby's house and they go inside and like there's a complete costume change yes I was just gonna say that (laughs) what why did he just have clothes her size just ready (laughs) just hanging out I don't know but I loved what Leonardo DiCaprio put on and I wrote legit though when has Leonardo DiCaprio ever been more handsome because he looked like perfect golden you know I I mean you see him on a yacht like perfect golden boy Mm -hmm. in that new outfit they had on where he looked casual but put together and I was like this is the Gatsby that he's always wanted to be yeah this guy right here right there yeah like and like this like he pulled out all the stops for when Mm -hmm. Daisy came by like this is what he always wanted to be this is the guy And he had to be that like heightened version of the guy for so long um, to get to the point where he could be the guy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, that's a moment where I feel like the cinematography choices and the costumes and the set stuff like really comes together in the movie to tell the story. So I liked that. Yeah, me too. And then my next note is, I've literally never seen wealth like this in my life. Um, (laughs) And then I just, okay, it's kind of obvious in the book that Gatsby's a bit of a stalker. But when he pulls out the scrapbook and he's like, every time I saw an article of you, I put it in the scrapbook, saved every note. I was like, oh, no, that's scary. I feel like anybody but Daisy would think that was super creepy, but she seemed to think it was very charming in the yeah. movie. Um, I was like, red so. flag. I I think Daisy, though, in the movie, they play her as someone who wants to be the object of that affection. Yeah. And she's not the object of that affection to Tom. True. Because, yes. so, um, maybe, like, I think everybody else is kind of like, he literally has a thick scrapbook about you that was okay. like scrapbook like number nine too we don't even know it was in the other ones mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so hmm. so and then he gets that weird phone call and mm-hmm. then the phone's ringing again and you can see her face like oh god <laughs> i yeah. think hearing the phone is horrible um but then so the next thing that i noted was that the next scene they go like it's the first time that um they go to one of Gatsby's parties and I wrote oh, down- I have a note before that really quick. Oh, just one thing before we switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, when he talks about Dan Cody, he says that the fortune was stolen from him by a family member instead of Ella Kay. Oh yes. Like, That's weird. Why would they change that? I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. I mean, was she married to Dan Cody? No, it was his mistress. Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> so yeah, that is an interesting choice. And why? Like what difference yeah. would it make? To say his mm-hmm. mistress or to say some random person that he knew, whatever. I don't know. Oh, it's a weird specific change, but sorry, I had to do that before we shift no, the scenes. That's next okay. to yours. No, I was gonna say the next scene is when they go to the, his party for the first time. And I wrote I have two notes. My first note is Tom's back, still hate him. <laughs> My second note is Daisy seems less disgusted with the party than she did in the book. Mm-hmm. Cause like in the book it was almost immediate that she it seemed like she didn't like it she thought mm-hmm. it was flashy blah, blah blah there was like all these things she didn't like about the party yeah but in the movie she was looking around she thought she loved the pool she loved the music she loved the you know ice sculptures i don't know like every single thing she thought it was mm-hmm. very charming and she enjoyed it and so i i think that was an interesting choice because yeah. one of the reasons that gatsby kind of stops throwing the parties in the book is because he thinks Daisy doesn't like them. Yeah. I wonder why they, well, one, they changed that, but two, I don't understand why Daisy wouldn't like the parties. She seems like someone who would have enjoyed that, but maybe it was just, just too much extravagance. Like, I think she's like a person that would flash their money, but not to the extent that Gatsby does. Cause it's kind of at a point where it's no longer classy. Yeah, I think it I think it has to do with like, okay, so if they're flashing their extravagance, but it's like a fancy sit down dinner party and there's rules and there's etiquette and there's um, a way things are done, quote unquote, I think Mm -hmm. that's different than like, in the book, the way that his things are described as like a free for all. 
Yeah. And so it might just be that it just doesn't sit with her, what she's used to or what she likes mm-hmm. or whatever. But you don't get that feeling. At least I didn't at all in the, the movie. Yeah. Same. Um, And then all of a sudden they're like talking in Nick's garden because Nick has a garden now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> His house keeps getting bigger and bigger with every scene. Like his shack is what I thought was like a studio shack situation is now has an immense garden and an ocean view. So there's that. And as they're talking, Tom goes and flirts with the movie star. And yet is so concerned that Daisy's not right next to him. Yeah. What is she supposed to bear witness to him flirting? I don't understand. And then Gatsby, when he's kissing all up on Daisy, I was not super sure that she was into it in the movie. Yeah, I got that feeling too. Yeah, she looks like a little uncomfy. And then he's like, it's time to tell Tom. And I'm like, oh. Mm, She's like, no, it's not. (laughs) And then when she goes away, I thought that's when he has like a really interesting exchange with um, with, uh, Nick and... Mm -hmm. Nick's like, you can't repeat the past. And Gatsby just has this face. Leo as Gatsby has this face. It's just like, no, like, like, hell no, you can't repeat the past. Of course I can repeat the past. Yeah. And I will repeat the past. Like, <laughs> I will double down and the past will be repeated. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just like, I, I feel that, I, I don't know, I people will argue with me, I'm sure. But I just, I really feel like Leonardo DiCaprio as an actor is a great choice Mm -hmm. for this character because he manages to have the extreme control that Gatsby has on such a tight leash that also when he switches to momentary lapses of that control, it's so shocking and so strong and his face is so expressive um in different ways like it's just i feel like he is an ideal actor to pull off the nuance that is hard to get off of the page yeah he's the perfect choice or it's like when you when you ask you're like oh which one do you want to watch i was like leonardo caprio like (laughs) eventually i'll watch the other one but like leonardo is such an amazing actor in everything he does that i could not wait to watch him in the great gatsby just to see what he's going to be like i mean as a side note for listeners i really like i i really think that robert redford is also just like he plays gatsby in the other version Mm -hmm. and he is like so hot and such a good actor and he also really embodies Gatsby in his own way and in his own time period um but I would say like for for us and as you know in our contemporary mindset and who we think of as like contemporary actors who could potentially be called forth to play this part Mm -hmm. I can't think of anybody else who would really do it the justice that Leonardo DiCaprio did. Yeah. Um, but for his time, like in the time period that the um, the Robert Redford version was made, like he is, he's a stone fox. Like, let's be, let's be fair here. He's amazing. Yeah. Um, so. And then according to the movie, Daisy and um, Gatsby actually had like a plan to leave Tom. Whereas in the book, it seemed very, it didn't really seem planned. Like, yeah, to it me seemed, at least it seemed planned in Gatsby's head, but you never got the feeling that Daisy was necessarily in on the plan. Yeah, yeah, and then then because of that, the suggestion to go to town was a panic response, which I liked because it seemed very random in the book. I was like, "Huh, why would they just suddenly go to town? It doesn't seem like it's going to be cooler when you're surrounded by skyscrapers." Mm-hmm. So I think the idea that that was like a panic answer, we need to be out of this room and moving. And I think that's such a good example of, in the book, it felt very panicked, but like because of this Baz Luhrmann cinematography, like this whole vibe that he had going, that scene is a perfect example of it being so heightened and so frantic and so Mm -hmm. fast paced that like when something, it's almost like a cold water was thrown on it. Mm -hmm. um and you can feel the tension 
Absolutely. you can feel it in that crazy car ride to the plaza. You can feel it. You can feel it when the you just see Leo like trying to flick the lighter for Daisy. Like every time he's trying to flick it and it won't go. Like you're just. I mean, you can feel the tension mm-hmm. in it, and it's very. It's just so heightened. It's another reason that I feel like this is a stage treatment of mm-hmm. this story because something like that would be so overly heightened um you would have to have it overly heightened to be read from a distance mm-hmm. um so for sure for and sure. then they all travel and the fact that they all could have rode in gatsby's car and didn't <laughs> like there yeah. was plenty of seats yeah but instead they choose to race for some reason um to get there and then which every single person in this movie and and this story doesn't know how to drive literally every single one of them is the worst driver ever and then my next note is that they're really forcing daisy to do a lot in this movie like it was bad in the book but Mm. it's even worse in this movie like they are fully twisting her hand on every situation absolutely they are really twisting her hand it's the same thing with um with nick and it's possible that in the book they're doing it just as much but since you're not seeing it you don't see it as extreme Mm -hmm. but they really are like when tom and gatsby are both just like playing on her emotions and then you see that one moment where gatsby kind of just like loses it because Tom pokes at the one thing about him that he is uncomfortable about Mm -hmm. which is the fact that he isn't he's isn't old money and his new money came from the mob yeah and gatsby just loses it and he realizes that the one thing he desperately wants and like why he needs this i don't know and i we talked about this when we talked about the book but like why he needs daisy to say that she absolutely not even for one second of her entire life loved tom is like if he could if he could be flexible on that one thing you know Mm -hmm. that that's the like rewriting the past repeating the past thing that Mm -hmm. he can't get over with nick in the conversation like if he could literally let that one thing go she would go with him yeah at least that's what it leads you to believe is like she would divorce tom and go with him because now he can provide for and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but he's like not gonna accept it unless she says never not even for one second yeah did she ever love him and like that's just not going to happen I, I really think it's because he was never wavering in his commitment to her and he feels like she wavered that he needs her to say that she never wavered because he didn't yeah I mean but that does speak to like the idea that Gatsby is in love obsessed whatever mm-hmm. with with a daisy that doesn't exist yeah for sure without a doubt sure he spent five years doing nothing but pining for her but in five years well first of all how well did he know her before those five years right like we talked about some this in the book but in the movie it was just like it was so intense like he does he cannot even like fathom it being okay that even for like a minute during those five years when she's trying to get over the fact that he wrote her and said, I can't marry you. Yeah. Right. Or some like indication thereof, something that led her to believe that, that that dream that she might have shared with him is over and that she has to marry Tom. Mm -hmm. Um, Like not even for one minute in those five years when she was trying to make a life that she could love Tom and for him to be okay with her. So like now she's completely, and you see it in the movie, you see it on her face, it's like, well, I can't do that. I can't have this one. And I might have lost this one too. Like, what what am I supposed to do here? Yeah, I um, really think that Jay-Z's just trying to have a happy, easy life. And every single person in her life that she's in love with is trying to make sure that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. I feel bad for Daisy. And I think she's in love with in love quote unquote or feels love or whatever for different characters in the book for different reasons and different things that they provide for her because like i feel like you know she has a certain like familiar friendship love for nick she has a love 
for Tom, maybe for the life that they have or whatever together, but she certainly is not in love with Tom. Yeah. She has a love for Gatsby that is, she's always had, but I don't know. I mean, is she willing to give up all the things that she has in her life now to express that? I don't know, but I just feel like the actors in that one scene, they managed to convey all of that in a really strong Mm -hmm. way. Um, So when they get in the car and start driving crazy again, you're like, oh, no wonder. (laughs) Yeah. And then my other note was the fact that when they get in the car, they hit Myrtle. That first of all, that visual of them hitting Myrtle was really, really good. But the next note I have is they don't even cover the body up right away. Like we don't know the time between Tom leaving and Gatsby having hit her. Uh, or not Gatsby, but uh, Gatsby's Daisy. car. Yeah, Gatsby's unquote. car, having hit da- uh, having hit Myrtle, but it's not right away. Like Tom doesn't leave as soon as they leave. They they seem to kind of pick things up and then go, and they don't cover Myrtle's body until Tom's already like getting there in the room and it's already flooded because they just laid the sheet over her body. Yeah, I think in the book they kind of touched on that it seemed like it was kind of a circus Mm -hmm. um but yeah that was definitely weird like there were just and the feeling of it it's it's again everything in the movie is a shade of the book and more heightened Mm -hmm. so i mean like even watching her fly through the air and like seeing like you can see the lacerations which they talk about in the book exactly what the lacerations are that's what you see Mm -hmm. um like across her chest and all this stuff and like then her underneath like when tom actually sees her like it's just like the book in those ways only heightened and then you see the you see what we only find out later in the book of tom having the conversation with wilson where he tells him like oh yeah totally it was that gatsby guy yeah but he also makes it sound like in that conversation like oh you better go get him because Mm -hmm. it's like that you just can't trust him yeah, he says he's so. like a crook and all this stuff. He like hypes up Wilson. Like Wilson mm-hmm. was just kind of sad in that moment. But I guess they didn't want to take the screen time to do that whole Wilson going mad thing, which is fine. But I mean, Wilson was already mad in that moment, though. He's like, yeah. well, remember in the book, Wilson is already kind of like gone a little bit crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's kind of gone a little bit crazy here already. Yeah. But even before when they first make the stop earlier in the day and Wilson, like in the book, they say he like looks kind of green or whatever. And he's Mm -hmm. talking about how they have to leave town. So he's already kind of losing his mind. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that the guy who, as a side note, I thought the guy that played Wilson looked a lot like Paul Newman. So if you don't know what I'm thinking about, I want you to look later at cool hand Luke and look at the guy who's the lead in it. I was like, is this his grandson? I don't think they're related, but he had just like such a vibe of, um, of Paul Newman. And I was, I was like, all right. You know, that movie where they talk about like kids taking their vitamins and it's basically an animated movie and it's like this vitamin becomes like a fighter in your body. Do you know what movie I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 He looks like the guy that was sick to me. (laughs) that actor and i can't remember the actor's name but he's like a big know. actor <laughs> it might be it might be paul newman we'll it look it up be. yeah anyway we'll have to look it up later anyways um so after all that they go back home they're like nick why don't you come inside and he's like i'm done with all of you i can't deal with you guys anymore um so nick's waiting outside gatsby's in the bushes they argue so loud that tom pops his head out for a second to see what's happening um, or or was it um was it a servant or something like a butler if somebody was, popped their head out yeah i thought it was tom but i might be wrong i mean it might be but yeah <laughs> i was watching on an ipad what can i say oh. <laughs> yeah. then um after all that happens they go back home it's the next morning gatsby's trying well it's not even the next morning it's basically in the middle of the night it's like 4 a.m gatsby's trying to clean the blood off of his car which Whatever. is completely like yeah like the whole the whole car is completely messed up so if anybody yeah. sees this they're going to know yeah they already said it's a yellow car you basically should just kind of like pull the whole fender off throw it away 
get some um, spray paint <laughs> yeah get some spray paint start painting your car you had a yellow car it's now a baby blue car okay like um yeah and then you know we get the entire scene of gatsby dying which i so the choices mm-hmm. cinematography i really was cinematographically i can't get that word out right i really liked the choices that they made i thought it was very heightened to have gatsby waiting for the phone call looking out at the green light and like on the edge of the pool and then tear you know juxtaposed with the picture of daisy like is she gonna call or is she not Mm -hmm. gonna call and then have the phone ring and have the butler be like oh he's been he'll be so happy to have heard from you and have that be the last thing he hears because that gives the feeling that the last thought he had was that Daisy loved him and called. Mm-hmm. But then in the movie, you realize it was actually Nick calling. So I thought as far as the movie goes, that was really cool. Mm-hmm. But as we know in the book, that's not quite what happens. Yeah. Um, so that was just like, it was a choice. Mm-hmm. It was an interesting choice, but it was a choice. <laughs> Yeah, Nick being on the other line of the phone as the gunshot rings out. I was like, oh, man. But I mean, at at the end, like, then you have to think, okay, but is that more dramatic or less dramatic than Nick literally being on the, like, stairs on the way to the pool when the gunshots ring out? So, I mean, six one way, half dozen the other. Either way, he is a front row witness to Mm -hmm. the death of this person who he feels a great affinity to yeah yeah so then we get gatsby's funeral well pre-funeral but like for some reason his pre-funeral they've still got like the cast open casket out (laughs) photographers are everywhere the funeral hasn't started yet and they're like and then the father doesn't show up so absolutely no one's in there which Mm -hmm. i don't mind that the father's not there it's a choice but it's like it makes it even sadder that absolutely no one showed up yeah and it's just like everything about it's just it's just a tabloid scandal Mm -hmm. that's what it's about after all he's done in his life that's what gatsby is he's a tabloid scandal yeah yeah and that is the 2013 great gatsby movie (laughs) it is it is it's very Um, good I, I did think it was pretty I did think it was pretty enjoyable definitely um I think that it's close like it's close enough in a lot of key ways that you could watch it and really enjoy it and I think it's enjoyable on its own I wouldn't watch it instead of reading the book if you're going to yeah. have a test on it <laughs> No. If you're a high school student listening to this podcast, Listen to this, our, professor, about the book. Yeah. <laughs> this professor is telling you, don't just watch this version of the movie because there's some key parts that your professor, that your teacher might probably ask you about uh, that you wouldn't want to make a mistake on. Yeah. But um, I don't know. The feeling of it is good. The It definitely adds to what we were saying when we talked about the book of that feeling um, of of reading the book and being like, ooh, there's some juicy stuff here. Mm -hmm. There's some juicy stuff in the movie. Um, So, plus if anyone's a Baz Luhrmann fan, I think they would also like this. Again, the visuals, the visuals. Yeah, I really liked it. I thought it was really good. It was a good adaptation. That's all we have for you all in this episode. And Jess, anything you want to shout out? I just think it's super awesome to have the opportunity to reread some classics with someone new reading the classics and watching the classics for the first time. Um, I have nothing particular to shout out other than the usual, which is, you know, uh, support your local libraries, read your classics if you like them or read something else if you like them, Mm -hmm. listen to an audiobook if that's how you want to have your reading time. And, um, yeah find some enjoyment and some old stuff and talk about it with your friends absolutely join a virtual book club they're great absolutely virtual book clubs are the best Mm -hmm. all right yeah we'll catch you next one bye all right bye
Thank you all so very much for listening to this episode of the Bailey Bookish Podcast. I hope you all enjoyed this covering of The Great Gatsby and The Great Gatsby Movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do have a Patreon exclusive coming out on Friday. Uh, It'll be Lost in Austin featuring Amanda Fay. If you want to get some exclusive episodes and some great bonus content, please consider subscribing over on Patreon.com. It's $10 a month. It helps support this podcast and you get some cool exclusives and I would really appreciate it. And you can find out about all the benefits by going to patreon.com slash barely bookish. Also, next, uh, the next book we're going to be covering is uh, Alice in Wonderland as well as Through the Looking Glass. And we will be having Leah from YA Book Chat um, on those episodes. So if you haven't listened to YA Book Chat, um, this will be a good fun little introduction to Leah and kind of how she she functions her episodes and all those good stuff but please check her out as well because her episodes are a lot of fun and her podcast is really great and she's a wonderful individual also if you haven't checked out the merch store please consider checking it out uh i wear the tank top all the time which is kind of weird to wear your own logo but like i love the tank top so i do it anyways um highly recommend them but yeah That's all I've got for you guys this week. I will catch you all next week with another episode. Bye!